This morning I want to give you eight truths regarding hearing God's voice from Abraham that we've been trying to get to for the last two weeks. And hopefully we'll make it through this journey taken from the book of Genesis 22. I want to read this passage of scripture in its entirety, verse 1 through 13, if you'll read along with me. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he said. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey and took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He says, said to his servants, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. He placed it on his son Isaac. He himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. And Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, uh, the fire, uh, the wood, they're here. Isaac said, but uh, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Which Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, Do not lay a hand on that boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns and he went over, he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. This Story, this passage of scripture lends itself to cause one to think that God is a very strange God if you did not know God. An unbeliever would read this passage of scripture and would have to declare that this God that you serve uh, is a bloodthirsty God and not something that I think I would want to follow. And certainly you would think that by reading that in the natural. But if you understand Jewish culture, this story makes complete sense. In fact, it brings incredible joy to to the Bible learner when they understand the power and the concept behind a word called covenant. The covenant is not necessarily a word that we throw around these days. We, we're more familiar with the word contract. In fact, we sign contracts quite often. And we sign contracts because we don't trust the other person. We have wedding ceremony. When I, when I perform a wedding ceremony, by the way, um, yesterday my son, our last child, uh, I married them. I performed the ceremony, which is now... All of my children are married. Thank you, Jesus. And, and uh, they're all, they're, <laughs> they all have now their own spouse and their own families. And, and uh, we'll see what happens next in this next season of life. But I made sure I tied that knot really tight. You know what I'm talking about? We, we're like double knot, you know, triple knot, no slip knot, no bow tie, no, well, you know, Whatever that, you know, that knot is that we tie our shoes with, I can't remember. We tied that thing really tight. And, but one of the things I was bringing up to them was sharing with them before we had the marriage ceremony and during the ceremony, as I was reminding them of what a covenant is. And, and a covenant is 
the highest form of a relationship that you can form with, a, with another person. It, it, it goes beyond uh, just a, an agreement. It's even beyond a handshake. It's beyond a contract. It's, it's something that two people make and, and it's so binding that, that they, the other person would rather die than to break that covenant. It, it, it's the highest form of a, of a promise that you can make. In fact, many people don't realize this, but a lot of our, well, at least the marriage vows that um, marriage things that we do in marriage come from the Jewish culture surrounding a covenant. It's actually just a, a modern way of reintroducing the covenant uh, ceremony because when they would make covenants with one another in Jesus' time, what they would do, two parties, different parties would come together and the first thing they would do is that each one would make promises to each other. This is what I promise I will do for you. And this is what I promise I will do for you. And we call that in a wedding ceremony vows. We make vows to one another. It's a form of making a covenant. And then after they made promises and vows to one another, then they would do something very important. It's very important for you to understand this because it makes a lot of sense when you read this passage, understanding this, that they would then exchange a gift with one another of equal or greater value than the other person would give them. That's how they would seal this covenant. They would do some other things like plant a tree or make an altar or make some kind of a monument there as well. But when they did this, they, 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 were, they were tied in, they were locked in. And now whatever this man had, you had access to. And whatever this man had, you had access to. It was, it was, it was, it was the most amazing type of relationship. But the beautiful thing that you need to know is that God would come along and he would make a covenant with Abraham. God would make a covenant with man and say, I want to be in a relationship with you. And what, what Abraham began to understand was that, that now this isn't just like another relationship with another person. I, I'm locked in with a relationship with God. And so, so now knowing that, this story makes sense because Abraham says to his two guys there at the bottom of the mountain, he says, y'all stay here and we're gonna go on ahead and we'll come back to you. So Abraham had one or two things going on in his mind and heart when he ascended into that mountain. And by the way, can I just tell you that that mountain range was the same mountain range and many believe the same spot where Jesus himself would be crucified thousands of years later. Isn't that crazy? But let me take you a little step further. Abraham, knowing that he was in covenant relationship with God, and God's asking him to give him his son, Abraham believed that one or two things. Either he was going to go up to that mountain, he was going to sacrifice his son, and God would resurrect his son somehow, and they would come back down the mountain. Or, get this, God himself would give him his son. Abraham would walk up a mountain with Isaac, but, but because he's in covenant relationship, he believed that when he came back down, if he gave God his son Isaac, then God would give him his son, whatever his son was. That Abraham truly believed by faith as he walked up this mountain that he would descend, if God's asking him of something, God will give back of equal or greater value his very own son. Come on, somebody. What kind of amazing faith was that? To be able to believe in God to that degree that, that and not even seemingly waver in this journey for three days to sacrifice his son understanding the premise of a covenant is huge. And when we say that now, and see, here's the deal. Why did, why did God want to do this whole thing to begin with? God wanted to get, do this because God wanted to get his son into the earth. He had to, God had to find a way, and his way was his son, 
to get his son to the earth so a perfect lamb could be slain from the foundations of the earth and now man's relationship with God would be restored again through his son, but he had to get his son to the earth. But how could he do that? By finding someone with enough faith in him that would make a covenant with him that when now they were asked to give his son, now God has the permission given by Abraham to give his son. Wow. And so Abraham takes a journey. And I want to just talk to you this morning about eight things I believe I can conclude from Abraham's journey in this scripture regarding hearing God's voice. Number one, that God will train you to hear. And turn to your neighbor and tell him God wants to train you. He wants to train you. He wants to tra train you to hear. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. I just thought of a story. Um, we had a little dog. We had a little puppy. Uh, was given. This is crazy. This is a crazy story. Uh, I got to share it. So I went to visit some people around Christmas time. My kids, my especially this girl. Oh, by the way, Faith is here and her husband Brett from California. Glad to have you here. Who is with child? Come on, somebody. Yeah. So we got we got them coming from north, south, east, and west in Jesus' name. And so Faith had been begging for a dog for years. And we're like, we're not having a dog. We're not, we're not doing it. And, uh, but anyway, I was visiting a couple in our church around Christmas, about a week before Christmas. <laughs> and I was visiting with them and they, they were, some things were going on, they were sick and I was praying for them. And uh, on the way out the door, they said, oh, Pastor, by the way, would you be interested in a puppy? I said, well, not, not really. But, but let, let me, before you say no, just let me show you. And they showed me this beautiful little tiny puppy. And, and it was just like, I, and I'm thinking of my daughter, Faith, and my other kids. I'm like, ah, my wife is going to kill me, but you know, I, 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 I got to do it. I got to do it. I just got to do it. And so, <laughs> and so I said yes. In a moment of weakness, they threw in the, 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 the dog carrier. They threw in the shots were already done. They, the dog, the five pound dog, they, everything. They gave me, they will give you everything. I'm like, I can't lose. This is a free deal. And so I said, okay, I'll do it. And so I'm walking out the door. I said, here's the deal. Can I come back like in one week, the, 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 the Christmas Eve, and pick it up from you? And so I'll just have it for, for the kids on Christmas morning. They go, yeah, well, that's not a problem. So I'm walking out door and I, and I turned around and said, oh, by the way, uh, what, kind of, what kind of dog is that anyway? And they said, oh, it, it's a uh, St. Bernard. <laughs> I, I, I lost my breath for a second and I'd already committed. I was in this thing. I didn't know what to do. And so I, <laughs> I went home and my my wife, she was fixing her hair and everything. I said, hey, sweetheart. She goes, what? I said, I got a great idea for a Christmas present <laughs> for the kids. She goes, what, 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 what is it? I said, well, um, it's like two gifts in one. <laughs> she says, what? I said, it's a, it's a horse and a dog. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know those bread rollers that you have, you know, in the kitchen? You ever chase your husband around the house, one of those? Anyway, so I'm trying to figure out how I, why I told you that story. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, so, there, so it was this. So this little dog, I'm like, this is a big dog. We need to train this dog. You know, we, so there was a guy in our church. He's an older fellow. And he, he told, he said, he's 90 years old. He said, Pastor JP, if you ever need to train a dog, I'm your, tra I'm your dog trainer. I've trained hundreds of dogs in my lifetime. And, and so I'm your man. And I'm like, well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. I don't think we'll ever need you, but I appreciate that. And, well, now I need him. So, I, I, so he can't drive. He's so old, he can't drive. So I go pick him. I said, Joe, we got a dog. Would you mind training our little dog? 
He said, absolutely. And so he gets in my car. I bring him. He wears a, a little ball cap all the time. He's got his bib overalls on. I bring him to the house, and he's out in the driveway, and I bring out the little dog to him. And, uh, <laughs> and he's on a little leash, and he goes, all right, sit. You know, the dog's like this, you know. Sit, he says. And so the dog's doing nothing. So he goes and pushes the dog's rear end down, you know. Sit. He stood back right back up, you know. So he kept pushing it down. I'm like, I don't know if this is the way you train a dog or not, you know. But he kept doing this, you know. And finally the dog just kept standing back up. And so he took his hat off. He goes, I said sit. And he started hitting my dog. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I said, Joe, I think it's time to go. I think we would probably need to. So that was the end of our, so he was, our poor dog was like, you know, like what kind of family have I been born into, you know? But I want you to know that God, God would, <laughs> I'm just having flashbacks to see this. But God will train you to hear. <laughs> and sometimes he may pull off his cap <laughs> you better get that rear end down and keep it down is all I can say <laughs> uh. But he wants us to be able to hear him in a clear way. And Coach Peterson, he was my first baseball coach of Corey League Baseball, first organized sport I ever played. I was like, couldn't believe. I mean, they handed us uniforms. and I was, I was like, this is amazing. But when the first set couple of days of practice, I remember Coach Peterson, he was probably the best coach I've ever had in my entire life. He said to us, he said, boys, we're all sitting on the bench, you know, and we're looking at him. He goes, boys, I got one thing I want to teach you. You need to listen to me. And we said, what's that? He says, you need to listen to me. That's what I'm telling you. Above all things, you need to know my voice and do what I say when I say it. If you do that, we're going to have a good season. We were a good team. We went to, we went to championship of the whole city of Denver, Colorado at that time. And uh, so I mean, I, he said, now listen, there's going to come a point where you're going to want to know. You're going to have to hear my voice. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on. You're going to have to hear my voice. A couple of games into the season, that moment came for me. I was on second base. Bases were loaded. It was one out. The guy was on the, on the, at the, at, at our teammate on the, at the batter's box and the coach was on third base. He, he said, JP, JP. He got my attention. I said, yes, sir. He goes, listen to me. You got it? Listen to me. Said, yes, sir. Ball's on the ground. You got to go. Ball in the air. It's a pop up, tag up. Listen to my signal. You hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm like, and then it happened, the crack of the bat, the ball was hit, and it was like the whole, like all of hell unleashed <laughs> on the baseball diamond. That coach on the other team was yelling. The, the players, their players were yelling. My, my, my parents were yelling. All the people in the stands were yelling. And the outfields were yelling. The ball was going up the middle. And it was like I could hear people yelling from other state away, another, <laughs> another nation. They were all yelling. It was like chaos had broken out on this little league diamond. And, and, and then it dawned on me, oh, I got to listen to the coach. And then I zoomed in. I was like, just like, I could hear everybody, but then I could hear the coach. Come on. It's what you got to fo you focus on what you, you want to hear. And, I, and I, I hear, go, 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 go. Man, I mean, I'm running. My little legs are running. I come, he's like this, go, go, go. I run around third base. I get about three steps past third base. He goes, stop, back, back, back. Down, down, down. I dove into third base. That, that man of that cousin, third baseman hit me in the back with the ball. Then the guy goes, the umpire goes, safe. <laughs> and I laid there thinking, what in the world just happened? This is the craziest thing that's ever happened. What? This is too intense. This is too much pressure. He goes, 
Stand up on the third base. Don't take your hand off the bag. Keep your foot on the bag and your hand on the bag. Then you can stand up. Once your foot's on the bag, you got that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm brushing the dirt off. He goes, son. I said, yes, sir. This is what I love to hear. Good job. Good job. See, I believe we have to learn and train ourselves to hear God. Now, last week we talked about it's not a skill. It's a hunger. Anybody can hear from the Lord. There's no professional God hears, no professional God whispers. It is just a hunger to hear from the Lord. And he will teach us how to hear him different ways. Sometimes you may hear God in like maybe a booming voice, an audible voice. Very few times do I meet people, nor have I had that experience of an audible voice from the Lord. I have met a few people that have heard an audible voice from the Lord. Maybe that was the voice that Elijah heard when he went into Ahab's court and said, oh, by the way, it's not gonna rain for three years. God told me so, unless you repent. Maybe I think that was probably what he had heard because later after this great revival broke out and Jezebel has now put a death warrant on his head. He's running for his life. He's out in the wilderness. God puts him up in the cleft of a rock and says, basically says, I'm going to teach you that I can speak many different ways. And he puts him up there in this little cleft of a rock. And the Bible says in 1 Kings 19, he said, God says to him, go and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord's about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then the wind, after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire and the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And Elijah heard the voice of God in a whisper. We, we have to be positioned to be looking for God to speak in multiple ways at any moment. Number two, I learned from this passage that the closer you get, the more you lose your history. For God told Abraham, Genesis 12, 1, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Leave, leave your family, leave your neighborhood, leave all that you're familiar with, and go to the place I am going to show you. If Abraham had not been willing to just unhitch then he would never have been able to experience incredible things that he would one day experience. I like the quote from Andre Gaidi. He said, man cannot discover new oceans unless he has the courage to lose sight of the shore. Are you willing to lose sight of the shore? Number three, I learned from this passage that darkness is not necessarily a bad thing. The Bible tells us that Abraham early the next morning got up to go. The implication is that he heard God in the nighttime. Night times are many times the times where you hear the Lord the best. In the dark moments. Psalms 91 verse four, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. Well, if you can just picture the Father God as a a bird, he's likening it as in this, that God puts you under his wing and he covers you. Well, if he covers you under his wing, it's, it's pretty dark. You can't see. But that doesn't mean that he's not there. Actually, what it means is you're closer to his heart than you've ever been. I like this, 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 uh, this analogy. 
And, I, and, I, and I, I was talking with some of the guys yesterday after early morning prayer. I said, you know, this is me sound really weird. I kind of feel like weird telling you this, but I have an affinity for doves. I'm like, I hear doves all the time. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like cuckoo. I'm not like, guy, what's wrong with your pastor? He hears doves all the time. I don't know. I mean, I can walk out of the house and there'll be a dove on the top of our roof, just going, coo, coo. I'm like, oh. And, and, I, and, and, and then I, I see them quite often. And whenever I do, I stop for just a moment. Because I, I realize, you know, the Bible is very clear that, that the, Holy, the Holy Spirit is a symbol of the dove. And so yesterday after prayer, uh, anyway, I, everyone's left and I go out to my truck and I walk around the truck. See, this is the bed of the truck. I walk around the bed of the truck to get to the front door and I open the door to get in and, and I look and there's a dove on the bed of my truck. I mean, he was sitting there the whole time and never like, like a foot, two feet from, from me. I walk right past him. He just like, and I, I opened the door and went, whoa, like, like that, like, whoa. And then I just, I didn't move. And he just sat there. And I'm having this epiphany. I'm like, okay, you want to say something? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, and so I'm just, I literally stood there. I, I took a picture, there it is, right there. It's just, I, so I'm just, I'm like, okay, we're just going to wait this thing out. I, would, I, knew, I wasn't, I, would, I, I felt like I couldn't even leave, you know? And someone reminded me this morning, Pastor, remember that the Holy Spirit isn't just the uh, symbol, symbolic of the Holy Spirit, but he's also a symbol of peace. And I'm like, whoa. Maybe God is saying to us as a church, the God of peace is here. I mean, I, I know you're like, really, you're just like. And he, maybe he's saying, I won't move unless you move. Mm. Maybe he truly is the peace that passes all understanding. And uh, so we just had a little fellowship going on for about 20 minutes. And finally, I went inside and it came out and he was gone. But, but I'm thankful that God speaks to us many different ways. And I'm thankful that you don't think I'm crazy by just sharing that with you. And in fact, the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And that word hovering literally means to be soft or to flutter like a bird. That the Lord, in, when it seems like everything else is dark, you still have to consider the fact that there is the Spirit of the Lord hovering. We, we, it, it may seem like you're isolated or you're in a bad spot, but I, I just want to remind you that perhaps it's not a bad dark spot, but maybe it's a close spot and your, heart, your ear is to the heart of God and you just don't know it. Yeah. And number four, I learned that God's voice leads from comfort zone to fear zone. Comfort zone to fear zone. People will say, well, perfect love casts out fear. We don't believe in fear. We don't live in fear. Well, I, I am, I'm with you all the way in that. But I will tell you that even when you follow after God, there are times when you have fear. It, you're you're going to get through it, but there's fear involved. Case in point would be Peter getting out of the boat. Jesus comes walking on the water. And all of them, the Bible says, are terrified. And in their fear, they cry out, it's a ghost. And it's in their fear that Peter asked Jesus, if that's really you, Jesus, to call and ask me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And in his fear, he steps out and puts one foot on the water. And in his fear, he steps out and puts another foot on the water. And in his fear, he takes a step towards Jesus. And in his fear, he takes another step towards Jesus. And in his fear, he takes another step towards Jesus. And he keeps going towards Jesus, even though his heart's filled with fear. And then when it dawns on him, what he's doing, 
and he looks around, he sees the reality that he's in the middle of a storm. He's terrified. The fear grabs his heart. He begins to sink. And the God of peace and salvation pulls him out and says, okay, you tried. That's good. I'm glad you took a step in fear. You can't follow God and not have moments in your life where you don't fear that you're really making a bad mistake. Or this is really stupid. It doesn't make sense. But that's where God lives many times. And he's asking you to come because once you step out of the comfort zone and you experience the fear zone, only then can you experience the destiny zone or God's purpose for you zone. Yeah. Number five, God gives direction but he doesn't always give details. I don't know why he's not in the details, but apparently he is not. The Bible does say that God orders our steps. And I want the worship to Ryan come, if you don't mind. And, and, and not only that, but, but he waits till you start walking till he gives you the details. Now, I don't know about some of you men in here, but whenever I, not whenever, there's been a few times when I've been shopping with my wife. And we'll, she, she well, you want, we gotta go to, she's not much of a big shopper, but when she goes shopping, she likes me to be with her. I don't know why. Because she doesn't utilize the great opinions that I have. <laughs> I just follow her around. And I usually ask this question, uh, by the way, what are we looking for? And when she responds, I don't know, I'll know it when I see it. Well, quite frankly, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. I just know that when it shows up, I'll know it's the right dress or the right whatever. Well, is there a picture in your mind? Maybe. Maybe there's a color? Long sleeve, short sleeve? Is No, I'll just know when I see it. And this is what God says to Abraham. I want you to get up and I want you to, to go up yonder. The Bible says in the King James Version. Just go up yonder, go up yonder. Now we understand that in the South, but even us in the South hearing the words yonder know that that doesn't mean anything. It just means somewhere up there, somewhere down the road, down yonder. I love being in a place now where I hear the Lord and I'm okay with the fact I don't know all the details. That's a good place to be. But I do believe that there are times where you're not gonna have all the details. I, in some aspect, I have to be honest, I, I don't like a whole lot of details. Just a few would be good. If you were to come to my door and say, hey, JP, you want to go play ball? I'd say, hold on, I'll go get my sneakers and I would jump in your car and I'd say, all right, where are we going? And what kind of ball are we playing? If you were to go to the door and ask my wife if she wanted to go play ball, she would say, what kind of ball? How big's the ball? Is the ball inflated or deflated? What kind of sneakers do I need? How far is it we're going? When are we gonna get back? What's the weather like? Who are we playing with? What's the humidity level at right now? This is what she, <laughs> I'm like, just go with it, just, just go. So some of you people that are OCD, you have a problem with going up yonder <laughs> to be with the Lord. But can I just tell you, you OCD friends, you're gonna have a tough path and a tough journey. 
if you can't just step out and start making the journey first and letting him fill in the blanks. Number six, I gotta quit, hurry up. The God, God's peace always goes with us. God's peace always goes with us. Number seven, pressing in leads to isolation. Abraham says to his servants, you stay here. Sometimes the further you go on with the Lord, the smaller the crowd gets. Hello? And then lastly, the ultimate test is hearing God under pressure. Can you hear God when all hell's breaking loose in your world? Can you hear God when your back's up against the wall and you don't know where the next paycheck's gonna come from and you don't know how you're gonna pay the rent or the mortgage or where that car payment, you, you don't know that next decision to make, you don't know uh, what you're gonna do, the child's sick and you got creditors knocking on your door, what, what, what are you gonna do? And can you hear God? Can you hear God under pressure? The Bible says that Abraham is led by God to a mountaintop. He takes his son, binds him, and places him on an altar, wood underneath him. And he is now in this emotional state that I can't believe, I would probably have somehow had a, I would have fainted, I would have passed out. I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I could have been under the pressure he was in and, and he takes the knife and he's following through. He's gonna go through it, this is it. And he takes the knife and he's about to plunge it into his son's heart when he hears the voice of the Lord again. Abraham, Abraham! Stop what you're doing. Stop. Because now I see that you fear me. What God was actually saying that we don't see in this passage, but God was actually saying, now that I saw, see that you were gonna go through with it, I've now released to give my son, but that'll be another story for another time. Thank you, Abraham, for being obedient to me so I could give redemption to the world. But the point of the story for us is this, uh, that if you do not hear a preceding word from God, then you will end up, listen to me, killing your destiny. Did you hear me? When you're, the pressure is on you, you can still hear God. Many times it's when the pressure is on the greatest that you have the most sensitivity to the voice and the pressures of the Lord. When you got the knife in your hand uh, and you're crying your eyes out uh, and nothing makes sense uh, and it seems totally opposite of what you feel you should be doing, that's when God says, hey, hey, hey. Was it not Jesus in the wilderness who said to the enemy when he was tempted with bread, make that stone turn it into bread? Was it not Jesus who said, are you kidding me? I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Are you hearing a proceeding word? What's a proceeding word? It's the next word that proceeds from someone's mouth. I'm thankful you heard God 25 years ago. I'm thankful that you heard God 15 years ago, five months ago. But what I wanna know is what are you hearing now? What is God saying in this moment? Uh, what is saying, God saying to us uh, in the season that we're in? We need to hear what the Lord is saying. Like John, like Revelation 1, here, 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 churches, listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. What is God saying to you, to your family, to you as an individual, to you as a leader in your business or school? What is God saying? I would like just to speak, first of all, to those as we close that are in this room and You've never been introduced to Jesus. Maybe you did at one time, 
had some kind of a relationship with the Lord. But could it be that God brought you here not by accident this morning, but by divine appointment? That you are here to begin to renew a new relationship with God? Or for some, a brand new relationship with a loving God? Could it be that God's hand is so orchestrated your life to bring you to this point uh, and this day and this hour in this month uh, that you could have an opportunity to come and meet the creator that made you, that knew you from the foundations of the earth, uh, fashioned you when you were in your mother's womb, that knew you even when you were in that womb. Uh, could it be that this could be the day you could meet that divine creator, the designer, the creator of all the universe uh, and have a personal relationship with him? What greater blessing would that be? Today could be that opportunity. So with every head looking around and every eye open, if you're here like, man, I wanna know Jesus today, or I wanna come back to Jesus today, this is the moment. I want you, I want you to raise your hand right now, right where you're at, because I, I just wanna pray with you. I, I, you wanna know Jesus, you're coming back to Jesus. Raise your hand right here. Let us make this moment right now. We're gonna make a covenant with Jesus today. You're out, come on, come on. I want everybody else, come on. Come on. Yeah. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. Come on. I'm turning my life over to the Lord. This is my day. This is the moment of my salvation. Amen. 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 Those that raise their hand, those that wanted to raise your hand, but you didn't because you're a little scared. We're going to help you. I want to just say a prayer with you. I just want, this is a prayer, the greatest prayer you'll ever make in your life. In fact, I'd like all of you to just pray this prayer with me. Would you just pray along and say this? Say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I know I need you. So I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. I surrender everything to you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And can we give Jesus a hand of praise for that? Praise the Lord. Pray that prayer. Thank you. Yeah. So as we get ready to close out, our prayer team is going to come up front. And I just want to lead us in a prayer today that God would help us learn to become sensitive to his voice. Come on. That we would be as Abraham could hear him even in the dark hours and be led by him in a miraculous way. So can we all stand to our feet this morning? Can we do that? Would you just lift your hands to the heavens like this with me? Would you do that? Heavenly Father, we're here today and we lean into you. Just as John rested his head upon your chest, the Last Supper, Lord, we we put our ear to your chest and we say, Father, speak. Speak to us today, tonight, this week. Help us become sensitive to the impressions of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord God, to follow after you and hear that preceding word that flows from your heart. Help us not to miss the day of our visitation in this incredible moment that we live in, in this generation and in this hour. We say thank you. We say thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.